This is technically lesson number 12 of Fallen Foes, A Study in Biblical Demonology. This is another part, uh, second part of answering the question, who are the Nephilim? We began last lesson in Genesis chapter 6 and introduced the word Nephilim or giants as the King James and New King James record it. If you haven't listened to lesson 11, I really implore you to go back and do so. It will lay a foundation for this particular lesson. Reason that we're studying this is because some claim that the phrase sons of God refers to fallen angels who married women and produced a race of giants called the Nephilim. And in the last lesson, we established three basic truths. Number one, the Nephilim only appear in two passages in Scripture. That is Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, and Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. The events in those two passages are separated by two things. Number one, a thousand years' time. Number two, a global flood, the flood of Noah. And so whatever happened to create the Nephilim had to have happened before the flood as well as after the flood. And number three, the presence of the Nephilim led to Noah's global flood. The presence of the Nephilim in Israel led to Israel doubting the Lord and wandering for 40 years. So whenever these Nephilim are around, good things do not happen. We ended the, by returning to Genesis chapter 6 verse 2 and then looking at verse 4 and finding these sons of God. Could we get a couple windows on this side cracked? That'd be all right. So tonight, this lesson is going to answer the question, who are these sons of God? And we're going to do it in two parts. One part tonight, and then one part next week. The first question we ask is, well, what does this phrase, sons of God, mean in other passages? Um, I have told you quite often, the best commentary ever written on Scripture is Scripture, not Matthew Henry, um, not uh, Kyle and Delich, although they may be good commentaries to study, but it's Scripture. So we're going to look at Scripture, and the next week we'll actually get into Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, and answer the question, what does the context of Genesis 6 identify the sons of God to be? This lesson is going to tackle that first question. So, what does the Bible say about this phrase, the sons of God? So I want to invite you to go in your Bibles to Job chapter 1 tonight. I will have, uh, throughout the evening, verses on the slides, but uh, for this I do ask you to see the passages with your own eyes as we look at them. Job chapter 1. Most commentators claim that the three times the sons of God appear in the book of Job, they are always a reference to angels. The verses are Job 1 verse 6, Job 2 verse 1, and Job 38 7. If you're taking notes, don't worry, we'll be back to those. Very few commentators or commentaries will say anything other than they are angels. What we're going to do is we are going to read Job 1, 1 through 12 together, and then chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Now, I cannot read chapters 1 and 2 all together tonight, and that is because of time. It is not because I'm trying to avoid something or... There is something secretly hidden in those verses that's going to undermine my position. That's not it at all. It is a matter of time. Please go back and read the rest of the chapters for yourself. So, without further ado, Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, and then we'll jump to chapter 2. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. 
Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys. We love donkeys, don't we? After last Sunday's sermon. A very large household. So this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send an invite to the three sisters and eat and drink with them. So it was that the days of feasting had run their course, or very literally had come full circle. These feast days, these traditions that the sons and daughters did, they're over. Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did regularly. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, hey, there it is, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around that he has on every side? Have You have blessed the works of his hands, and his possessions have increased in that. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now look at chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From whence do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro of the earth and walking back and forth on it. Have we heard this before? Same thing, isn't it? And the Lord said, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And he still holds fast in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. Now, what happens is Satan makes his attack in the verses that I have not read between verses 13 and 22. And Job loses his family, his wealth significantly. Okay. In reading those texts this evening, how many of you saw the presence or the word angel? Anyone? Emma, did you see it? Chloe, were you paying attention? Did you see it? It's not there. Okay. Satan is here in this text, right? Is Satan a fallen angel? Yes. He appears in verse 6, and then in chapter 2. He is there again in verses 1 and 2. He certainly seems to be in the presence of the sons of God as they come, and what the text says, to present themselves. So, let's look at Job 1 verse 6. There was a day when the sons of God came to what? Present. That word present means to stand. Really simple. They're standing before the Lord. Now, here's where it gets interesting if you study commentaries and commentators. They assume and assign definition to this word stand. Many commentators will say and provide answers to the following questions. Why were the sons of God standing before him? Were they giving account for their actions? Is this in heaven or on earth? 
were the sons of God receiving marching orders to go and do his will. Can I give you a simple answer to all those questions? We don't know. Do we know what they're doing standing before the Lord? Not really. Do we know if they're giving an account for their behavior or getting orders? Nope. Do we know if this takes place in heaven or on earth? Does the text say? But pasta, my study notes. No, no, I'm just going to ask you that. We are here to study the word of God, not your study notes. If we just read the text for what it says, we have to come to a conclusion that I don't really know a lot about what is going on. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Because the Septuagint, the Septuagint, what's that? That is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. So this is the translation that Jesus would have used. Um, it is a translation, simply a translation. It is not re-inspired, just like Modern versions or even older versions from the 1600s are not re-inspired. They are translations, okay? The Septuagint says the angels of God. The angels of God. There's a few older translations too that say angels of God. But here is what the Hebrew text says. Are you ready? Ben Elohim. Sons of God. That's what the text says. Doesn't say angels. It says sons of God. There are a couple of modern translations that take some liberties. Uh, how many of you ever heard of the Good News Bible? It used to be the Good News for Modern Man. Yeah, that translation's bad news. I don't even know if it's a translation at this point. It's probably just a paraphrase of a nice story that's thrown out there. Uh, there's the Common English Bible, same type of idea. They actually supply a concept of the divine beings came before God. But the word here is sons of God. The phrase here is sons of God. Okay? Are angels directly mentioned in Job 1 at all? The answer is no. No. But let's do some digging here. Um, understand that the same occurrence in Job 2 Satan came before them. The sons of God came to present. They are standing before God again. But I want to dig, because when you have words and context in a chapter, it's very wise to pay attention to those words. So what I want to do is, once again, I want to read selected verses in the chapter that actually contain the word son. Are you ready? Job 1, 2. There was a man in the land of us, land of us, whose name was Job. Man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. Verse 2, he had seven what? Sons. Uh, are these God's sons or Job's sons? Job's sons. Verse 4, and his sons. Who are they? Job's sons. Verse 5, so it was when the days of feasting had run their course, Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early uh, in the morning. Burn offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons. Who are they? Okay, so three out of three, Job's sons. Now, go down to verse 13. Now, where there's a day, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking. And then verse 18. While he was still speaking, another came in and said, your sons and daughters were eating. Who are these? So five occurrences in the chapter, and who are the sons? They are Job's sons. And then we have two occurrences in 23 verses. I'm going to extend it from chapter 1 and go into chapter 2. But we find in verse number 6, there was a day when the sons of God came. And then chapter 2, and there was a day when the sons of God came. So five occurrences of the sons of Job, and two occurrences of the sons of God. What's going on? 
Do verses 6 of chapter 1 and chapter 2, verse 1, all of a sudden change the audience to someone else. Is there any explanation in the chapter that tells why there's Job's sons and the sons of God? I would suggest to you there is. But let me ask you this. In this passage, is there anything that identifies the sons of God as angels, just the way we read it? I can't hear you. No. No. Let's look at verse 5. Go ahead, Rob. Verse 5. It's uh, the verse on the board. It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Okay, let's talk about it. Let's cover it right now. Yep. Then it says, Thus Job did real, but I thought Job was blameless and upright. Yes. Good questions, Rob. Let's go for it. You ready? So it was. When these feast days, Job's sons and daughters performed, had run their course. When they had come full circle, the feast season is over. I wonder if winter set in. Because Job does talk about snow. But Job would send, and I've supplied here the word for, because it's the only thing that makes sense. He would send. And when you send for someone, what is the expectation? They, they come. And not only does he send for them, he wants to do what with them? Sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer, oh, a what? For an offering. According to the number of them all. So get this. So Job is sacrificing with his family. And specifically, it does say by the end of the verse, his sons. He's afraid that his sons. He doesn't seem to be too concerned about his daughters. But it's his sons who have sinned. Each one is provided a sacrifice, according to the number of them all. For Job said, it, it, it might be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did regularly. So notice two things. He sent for his sons, and he sacrificed with his sons. Is this a weird concept in the Old Testament? Is it? Well, what about Exodus 19.10? For the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. This word sanctify, guess what? This is the same word used in Job. Well, what about 1 Samuel? 16.5, and he said, Peaceably I come to sacrifice unto the Lord, and sanctify yourselves, and come to me with a sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons. This is Samuel calling them to the sacrifice. So here is the picture. In the Old Testament, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, is that principle still in effect in the New Testament? Yes. What is the difference? Christ died once and for all. Hebrews makes that very clear. There is no need for the shedding of blood of sheep or goats. It's all done. Happened at Calvary. Aren't we celebrating something about this coming this week? Yeah. All right. You understand? Job lived prior to the Mosaic law. So in order to have forgiveness of sins prior to the Mosaic law, what did a man have to do? Well, let me ask you this. What did Abraham do? He sacrificed. What did Cain and Abel do? Oh, well, I remember that story. Abel brought an acceptable sacrifice. 
Cain did not. Where did they get this from? Adam and Eve. Where did Adam and Eve get it from? God. Now, do I have a verse that says, Thou shalt sacrifice Adam and Eve? I don't. But it is very apparent by the time that we get to the story of Cain and Abel, God says, I want this sacrifice. It has to be blood. I don't want your vegetables, Cain. So whether it's inscripturated or not, if I can use that term, whether we have written revelation in the Bible, there is a mandate of sacrifice for the shedding of blood once sin enters into the human race. So now, Rob, to answer your question, in verse 1, there's a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. He's blameless and upright. Does that mean he is perfect and sinless? Bingo. When Job sins, does he still need a blood covering? Yes. Just like if his sons sin, they need a blood sacrifice. You with me? Makes sense. Job and his sons sacrificed before the Lord a burnt offering to cover sin. Is that a profound activity or something unusual in the Old Testament? No. No, it's not. What's the end say? They did so. So let me ask you this. So if Job is upright in heart, he is blameless, and he shuns evil, could it be it is because of this? Yes. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, forgiveness. This is how Job stays blameless. He confesses his sins before the Lord. Now get this. In verse 5, who is he teaching to do this same thing? Well, his sons. Dads, isn't that a beautiful picture? It's an incredible picture, isn't it? So don't think of this, oh, well, Job is a worry wart, and he's going, oh, no, I think my sons have sinned. I should sacrifice for them. That's not it. I don't think that the sons are scattered all around their localities and where they live, and Job is over here at his house making sacrifices on behalf so God forgives their sin when they are not with him. That doesn't make sense if Job sends for his kids and then has them sanctified, made holy through sacrifice. Avery. Those two sacrifices are in um, sacrificing the blood it is 100% literal do you know why what happens this week 2000 years ago is that figurative or is it literal if it's figurative we have a problem right Jesus crucifixion there were animals that were Exactly right. Chris. There's a passage that said the soul that sinned, it shall die. Yes. But in the case of the animals dying, that was a substitutionary. That's right. For the four That's right. sins. That's why they would put their hands on the animal and confess their sins. That's right. Over the animal. Now, Avery, this is the most disgusting, wretched picture. But God paints it of why Christ's sacrifice is so beautiful. Pretty gruesome to sacrifice an animal on your behalf, isn't it? Are you uncomfortable with that? That's the point. That is the point. And this is why Christ did away with it, to teach you the importance of his sacrifice. Ah, there you go. Good job, Avery. A father suspected his sons of sinning. He shows them how to remove their sin. Now, the word burnt for offering here, burnt offering, it means to ascend. It means to ascend. The entire animal was sacrificed and then burned on the altar. Leviticus 3.5 says, And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is on the wood that is on the fire. 
and an offering made by fire is a sweet aroma to the Lord. It does not matter if it's pre or post Mosaic law. It's still the picture of sin covering. I don't see a difference between what Job is doing and what Aaron was doing. The smoke of the burnt animal after the blood's been shed is received into God's nostrils as a sweet aroma. So that's the context of verse 5. On a day that Job is sacrificing. Now, if we take the literal natural reading of verse 6 on the back of verse 5, is it really that confusing, ladies and gentlemen? Look at verse 5 again. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, and Job would send and sanctify them, he would rise early in the morning and burn offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Is there anything unnatural about the flow of that text? Verse 7 says, And the Lord said to Satan, or, I'm sorry, verse 6, And the sons came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan gives his answer, I've been walking all about to and fro on the earth. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, God says, Hey, Satan, have you considered Job? Isn't that kind of strange? Does God know why Satan is coming? Yes, obviously. Could it be that the reason God mentions Job right away is because Job and his sons are the ones sacrificing as the sons of God on the day that is appointed to do so? I don't think Satan or God just randomly chooses. I think this is the context of the day where Job and his sons would come together regularly and they would make sacrifices together. And on that day, while Satan is mentioned, no other angels, fallen or unfallen for that matter, are ever mentioned in the text of Scripture. So how do we get angels out of this text of Scripture? We don't. You have to put them in there. They're not in there. Now, I do have many friends and commentators that I like and trust that say, these are angels. Well, you can say that. I'll respect that you want to take that view. But just understand, that's not what the text says. What's the difference between Job's sons and the sons of God? I would suggest that Job's sons are part of the sons of God, and so is Job. It is the day they came together for sacrifice. I don't have time to develop this point. Let me ask you this. What is the day of sacrifice in the Old Testament? Sabbath. When does Job live? About the time of Abraham. Yeah. So prior to Moses. Exodus 20 is the giving of the Ten Commandments. Um, do the Ten Commandments firstly establish the Sabbath day? No. When was the Sabbath day established? Creation. The day of rest. Huh. You think Job knew about Sabbath day? I suspect he did. Discussion for another day. I see this group, the sons of God, being Job and his sons, the day they came to sacrifice for sin before the Lord. I think that is a common, simplistic, literal reading of Job 1.6. And if we come in and say, no, no, they're angels, you can say that, but could you please show me where that is in the text? It's not there. It's not in chapter 2. Any questions about that before I go on to the next part of Job? Anybody? Who Job up to Satan So, Rob, when we ask questions of why does God do this, I will always tell you I have no idea. 
My thoughts are not God's thoughts. My ways are not my ways. I can never put myself in God's place and reason why God does or does not do something. But this does serve as a lesson of how to be encouraged and faithful in trial. There are many here that have loved the book of Job through the years, that have been through great trials. And then by the end of the story, Job comes forth bigger, holier, and better than ever before. Alan? Like Job, when I think about things I'm glad that you've never had a Job day. That's wonderful, huh? Okay. Let's go to Job 38, verse 7. This is the third place. 38. Oh, bad slide. Hold on. Sorry for those online. It's 38, not 8. <clears throat> To what were, and I'm going to say the earth's foundations, fastened? Or who has laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together? And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Question. Are there angels mentioned in the verse? Nope. What do we got? We got stars and we got the sons of God. That's what we have. However, when you come, most commentators will say these are angels. But let me just tell you to consider a few things. Number one, angels are not mentioned directly. The morning stars do what? They sing. And then the sons of God do what? They shout. Um, just on a rabbit trail, this morning stars, this, this concept, it's not the same wording as Isaiah 14 with Lucifer, son of the morning, as the King James translates it, or as I would translate it, Venus, son of the dawn. Remember, Lucifer is not Satan's name. It is the Latin name for the planet Venus, that first star that comes up at dawn on the horizon. The wording here is different. These are plural. It is not an individual. This is very literally stars, planets. Now, here's the question. Do planets and stars sing? Not in your lifetime. Okay, but what about verses like Psalm 19.1? The heavens declare the glory of God. So, you know, you look up into the sky and it says, Look at God! No? No? But in some way, they communicate God's glory, and this atmosphere, the firmament, shows his hand here, right? But are they actually yelling in a voice or declaring? No. Um, what about Psalm 148.3? Praise him, sun and moon. So, if you get the biggest microphone on the planet, and you hold it above the highest, you know what? Put it on the SpaceX um, um, rocket. And if you listen very closely, you can hear the sun going, la, 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 right? Is that what this verse is saying? No. So if God creates creation and it's all groaning, can you go, huh? Do you actually hear it groan? No. So let me pause here just to, to clarify. So, your teachers here at church, whether it be Dale or Ben or Scott, myself, Green, or any other of our teachers, we always teach you to take the Bible as literally as possible. Have you heard that message from this pulpit? Yes. Okay. That's what we did in Job 1. However, you also have to take the Bible not only literally but also in context. In context. Job 1 is not poetry, it's narrative. It's the telling of a story, account of real events. Job 38, however, is poetry. God is responding to Job's complaints 
through the use of Hebrew poetry. Now these words in this poem are inspired, and they are right, and they are true. They are painting a picture, a marvelous one, of creation. So let me illustrate it this way, okay? Now, Pastor, I'm confused. Because you always tell us to take the Bible literally, okay? So let me give you an example. Second Chronicles 6.19. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Lenny, you're laughing at me. So, does this mean that God's eyes have feet and they run to and fro throughout the earth? Is that what that means? What does it mean? Ah, God is omnipresent. He sees everything. Okay? Okay? Was that really that hard? No, no, but that's kind of what's happening here in Hebrew poetry of Job 38. It's poetic in nature. The stars declare the glory of God. They sing to the Lord. Does that mean that the North Star Polaris all of a sudden shouts out, Alleluia, Alleluia? No. That's not what it could have. But no. It's what we call a metaphor. It's a picture. And so when we get to Job 8, 6, 38, 6 or 7, again, wrong slide, it's 38, not 8. To what were the earth's foundations fastened? Wait a minute. The earth has foundations? Does this building have a foundation? Yep, sure does. It's on a rock foundation. A couple hundred years ago. Does the earth have a foundation? Or who laid the earth's cornerstones? Were you there, Job? So the earth has a cornerstone? So if you pop that baby out, the earth goes and all down? Is that what that means? No. We have a problem if you try to take it literally, because Job 26 uh, verse 7 says, He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. But wait a minute. This verse says that the earth is fastened to a foundation and it has a cornerstone. So which one is it? It's poetry, people. It's painting a beautiful picture of creation. Context determines the meaning. The stars, are they actually singing songs to the Lord? Just as much as the earth has cornerstones and a foundation. It's poetry. It's a picture. The stars don't literally sing. But in the same breath, in verse number 7, what's interesting is, this is a poetic couplet. So the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. A poetic couplet combines these two ideas and that they are one and the same. They are the same thing. So the morning stars singing together is the same concept of the sons of God shouting for joy. And it doesn't actually say shouting for joy. It just says shouting for joy has been supplied. Okay? So I would suggest to you that the morning star singing is the same concept as the sons of God shouting. You're with me so far? I think, I suspect, and I'm going to say this, I believe, this verse is referring to creation. I see no mention of angels. Context determines meaning, right? Chapter 38, same chapter. Look down to verse 31. Can you bind the cluster of Pleiades or loose the belt of Orion? Uh, you know, on the way home tonight, we're going to park in our parking lot. I'm going to look up who's going to be looking at me if the clouds are, are gone. I can find Orion like that pretty quick. And then I can navigate and see all the other constellations that I want. Um, there are three stars in the belt of Orion. Who can loose them? The answer is nobody. Can you bring out Maseroth in its season? Oh, this is an interesting one. Maseroth is a group of 12 constellations, literally meaning the garland of crowns. Each of the 12 constellations 
has three other constellations, making up a total of 48 constellations. Does any nutty know the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word Maseroth? Anybody? You ready for this? Zodiac. <gasps> the Bible teaches astrology? No. I'm not suggesting that God invented astrology. But do you know what God did invent? Astronomy. You know why? Because he made it. Humans can marvel at God's creation, but we are warned not to worship the creation. Who made all the constellations in their places, ladies and gentlemen? God did. Man didn't come up with that concept. Orion's already named in Job chapter 1 and is the oldest book, or in Job chapter 38, it's the oldest book in the Bible. God named them too. There is nothing wrong with being an astronomer. But using the stars to determine your future is an abomination to the Lord, and that is astrology. Nevertheless, we can see how God arranges the constellations, and they declare his glory because he arranged them. Now, I want to come to the last phrase of verse 32. Who can guide the great bear with his sons? Uh, if you have the King James, uh, I think the New King James, it actually says the great bear and its cubs. What in the world is that? Um, this is so easy to understand. Do you understand that there is a constellation that is referred to as the great bear? Does anybody know its name in our modern age that we call it? Ursa Major. Ursa Major. It's the largest northern constellation, third largest of all. Guess what? It is the home of the Big Dipper. And no, that is not an ice cream cone over at Dairy Queen. Oh, there you go. Lagos is now what they have the Big Dipper? I don't know. Avery's going to go find out after service. Anyway, so the sons of Ursa Major. Wait a minute. Constellations have kids? No, they don't. But are there stars within the constellation of Ursa Major? And are there stars related to Ursa Major? Yeah. I wonder if the sons of Ursa Major may be the stars that make up Ursa Minor. Now, there is a total Greek mythology that says Zeus had this child and this child became... Well, just remember, Zeus is probably actually related to Baal. So yes, there is a satanic astrology that we reject. I don't think Ursa Major has children, okay? And so what I see Job chapter 38 verse 7 is simply as a reference to the sons of God is the creation crying out, proclaiming God's glory. I don't take the sons of God in this poetic form as a literal thing where these ones are shouting. Why? Because in the same couplet, planets or stars cannot sing. See, I think it's poetic in nature. Every argument, every argument that I come by claiming fallen angels are in Genesis chapter 6, all say that unequivocally all three passages of Job contain angels as the sons of God. Did you see that tonight? I didn't. I didn't. And so I don't think that we can say fallen angels married women produced giants based on the dogmatic belief that every reference in Job to the sons of God are always angels. I can't agree with that. I don't see it. There are a few more references to sons of God in the Old Testament. Uh, for example, I said, you are gods and all of you are sons of the Most High, sons of Elohim. I can't see this as angels. I think it's Israel. 
I don't, I don't see an allowance for this as angels. Now, there is a textual variant in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. When the sons of the most high, when the most high divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. If you look at your King James and your New King James, it says children of Israel. There is one manuscript out there that says the concept of sons of God. Um, Coincidentally, the Septuagint followed that one manuscript, so it is relatively old. But I still don't see how you get angels out of the verse, whether it's sons of God or children of Israel. Um, this is not the exact same form, but give unto the Lord, you mighty ones, the sons of El. It's not the sons of Elohim like the other passages, sons of El. And sometimes you'll see this as the children of the mighty or the mighty one. But there is no evidence that this is angelic in nature. Um, Psalm 89, verse 6, for those in the heavens can be compared to the Lord. Who among the sons of El, again, the mighty ones, can be likened to the Lord? It's not the same form, but it can be a concept of El. Could this be angels? I don't see that it has to be. There's nothing dogmatic here. Now, when we get to the New Testament, who are the sons of God? Well, that argument is easy. Whether it's Matthew 5, 9, Luke 20, verse 6, Romans 8, 14, Romans 14, 19, Galatians 3, 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So when you get to the New Testament, are there any angels referred to as the sons of God? Never. So, here's what we've done tonight. We have taken the concept of the sons of God, and we have traced it from the first book in the Bible, Job. Written, Genesis comes in their order, Job is the first written. And we have tried to look at instances throughout the Scripture where the occurrences in the Old Testament where sons of God actually appear. Can we dogmatically say that a single one of them is angels? I would say, I'm not convinced any one of them is a reference to angels thus far in my study. So if that would be the case, why would I come to Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 and say, these are angels? It can't be based on Job. It can't be. In order to get that, you have to take the thought from somewhere else out of the Bible, and infuse it into Genesis chapter 6. Okay? In the next lesson, we'll go back to Genesis 6 and start weaving everything together by looking at the context. Okay. Questions before we close? I've gone longer than I intended. Jim? One of them, that Psalm 82, that refers to people. Jesus used it in the New Testament when he called me Yes, so what about the sons of God? God called them Elohim. That's right. And through the words of God came. Yes, sir. So <laughs> don't get at me just because I'm saying I'm the son of God. Yep. Your own prophets are called Elohim. Moses was called Elohim. That's right. And That's right. Moses was his prophet. Right. And just to clarify, and we'll, we'll clarify this in a future lesson, um, understand that Jim is not saying that we are God. That's not what he's saying. Okay. Elohim is a title. It's not a name. What is God's name? Yahweh. Elohim is a title. And in most contexts, it refers to God, the Trinity. It's plural. However, there is a divine nature in some passages that it may refer to something else. Context terms that way. So we'll look at that in another lesson. But Jim, you're absolutely right. Wasn't the shepherds following the star? Yeah, um, the Magi Shepherds, falling star. Hmm. Where'd they learn that from? Interesting. All right. All right, we're going to close in prayer. Father, thank you for this lesson. We appreciate what you have put in the scriptures for us. May we learn greatly as we still are seeking to find answers in Genesis 6. In Jesus' name I pray.
Thank you for joining us online. I appreciate it tonight. Lord bless you.